To some of you, the discussion we are going to carry along in this series may be a little new or novel, but many are already aware of the existence of at least the symbolic factors with which we are to be concerned. The possible relationship between astronomy and religion has been so often discussed that nearly all Bible students, the students of comparative religion, are aware that such analogies or parallels do exist. We are interested, therefore, in determining, if possible, their validity and what they have contributed to our general knowledge of man's beliefs. Perhaps astrotheology would be a useful instrument as a common denominator of religions, for elements of it and traces of it are to be found throughout the world. In some way, for some reason, and the origins are obscure, these concepts unfolded together with man's religious and philosophical ideas and became almost universal. Now how does this happen? The most obvious answer lies in the original unity of arts and sciences in the religious life of people. The first stargazers on their tall towers or ziggurats in the land of Babylon, these stargazers were astronomer priests. There was no differentiation between science and religion. We may say that almost certainly sciences were originally cultivated because of their religious content or for the reason that they helped to support the religious convictions of the people. We know that the temples were the first colleges and the ancient towers and palaces of the gods were the first astronomical observatories. There is a legend which some of you may have run across to the effect that the constellations were named by shepherds watching their flocks at night and with very little else to do allowed their imaginations to trace the imageries by connecting stars into patterns in which some likenesses or appearances uh, to various creatures could be traced. I think these shepherds were the shepherd priests or the shepherd kings of old times, the keepers of the sheepfold, which was the ancient name for the temple. In any event, many words that we use, many terms that we commonly uh, find in our language, arise from the religious, astronomical reflections and contemplations of our ancestors. Actually, as one of the ancients observed, astronomy is the science of the anatomy of the universe. And, to a measure, these same ancients believed that the universe was the body of a blessed God. Therefore, astronomy might be termed uh, the uh, anatomy and even the physiology of the body of the deity. This deity being represented as this God who is extended and distributed throughout the infinite diversity of his own parts and members. In any event, at a very remote time, men learned a considerable about astronomy. It is quite likely that there have been cycles of remembrance and forgetfulness in this subject. A. E. Wallace Budge, keeper of the Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities of the British Museum, declared that the Chaldean astronomers watched and measured and charted the motions of the heavens for more than 25,000 years. Now, of course, from a man of his standing, 
This is a rather unusual statement. And yet I am certain that he felt that he could prove it. This tremendous amount of observation, even without the instruments that we know today, must have led to a variety of discoveries. We feel, for example, that ancient man was greatly limited in his astronomical researches by his lack of a telescope. Yet we also have record that the ancients knew certain things about the solar system in particular, which it seems impossible they could have known without some kind of a telescopic equipment. Perhaps the Chinese have the answer. On the wall of the city of Peking, there is the remain of an ancient observatory. It was partly reconstructed by the early Jesuits, but the instruments are essentially Chinese, and they have a complete observatory without a telescope. Now, what they did to meet this peculiar need was a masterpiece in optics. They discovered that by using a long hollow tube without a lens, they could restrict the light of the sky and concentrate the energy going into their own eyes. And by means of these tubes without lenses, they were able to make a number of observations which would not normally be possible to the individual. They were able to give us a very clear understanding of many peculiar details. For instance, we find in other parts of the ancient world the full and obvious knowledge that the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Persians at an ancient time knew definitely that the planet Venus was never visible to us as a complete sphere, but most often like a minute lunar crescent. They also discovered in the field of Babylon the rings on Saturn, and the ancient deity of the Babylonians corresponding to the deity Saturn is always shown st standing in the midst of rings which circle his body. These things are not just accidents. They tell us that at a long ago time, men made comparatively accurate observations of the world in which they lived. Pythagoras, writing or teaching about 600 years before the beginning of the Christian era, was one of the first to note that the planets and their chariots, the chariots of the gods, circled around the blazing altar of the sun. He is accredited generally with the first statement of the heliocentric system of astronomy as we know it today. How then have we forgotten all these things? The only answer is that in the waste of time, in the destruction of learned institutions, in the gradual decadence of the great temple mysteries, conquest, pillage, war, and destruction, many choice and valuable records were hopelessly destroyed, as in the case of the destruction of the great Serapian and Brockian collections in Alexandria. Thus we dropped a dark curtain across history, having obliterated most of the early relics and records of man's intellectual life. We have every knowledge, then, that in the general and broad need of the world, ancient man was reasonably well equipped. He knew the earth was round. He was aware of the western hemisphere, long before the beginning of the Christian era. And according to Plutarch, the historian, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes area of the United States was explored by Grecian navigators at least 15 to 1800 years before its rediscovery at the time of Columbus. And of course, Columbus really was searching for a passage to Asia. He did not realize in the beginning that he had discovered a new continent. These ancient records and many legends and myths and fables all point out 
things that we should know, but which we have gently ignored. It is almost certain that the Chinese navigated the coast of California 2,500 years ago. And during the period of Genghis Khan, 12th, 13th century in Mongolia, the Chinese and Tatars were well aware of the Western Hemisphere. We have forgotten a great deal. And we have forgotten a great deal of the source of what we call existing knowledge and the reason for it. And many things which we consider to be superstitions and legends really developed from a very astute observation of natural phenomena. One thing that ancient man had that we do not have is leisure. Now the common man of his day, whether he was a builder of pyramids or an agriculturist, probably did not have much leisure. But there was a very broad, deep, scholarly class, particularly the priesthood, then the custodians of all knowledge, who not only had leisure, but an infinite kind of patience, which also runs short with us. This is the kind of patience which will permit a problem to be passed down through twenty generations without impatience. Observations and reflections were not carried on by small groups in a period of months, weeks, or even years, but became the projects of empires and of dynasties and of descents of families, so that one problem may have been labored over for a thousand years, each generation, each century, bestowing its own fragment of further insight. Thus, by observation, with great patience, man accomplished much. Another factor which had something to do with all this was man's dependency upon himself. Today we are no longer dependent upon the faculties and powers with which we were originally endowed. We have supplemented these powers and faculties by innumerable devices, depending more and more upon mechanistic substitution. We no longer need or call upon the resources of our own observational powers. Some years ago an experiment was carried on one of the American Indian reservations where it was demonstrated that a certain Indian of reasonable attainments, not a cultured man as we would term one, just a man who lived with his flock watched them at night like the shepherds of old, and lived as our primordial ancestors lived, this man could distinctly hear a watch ticking in a man's pocket 65 feet away. We have no such power of hearing as this. It's gone, because we have no need for it. The present moment, we pick up the phone, get the correct time. Our entire way of life, when someone wants us to get out of the way on the road, they give us a blast we can hear a mile away. The individual no longer needs these faculty. he does not re faculties. He does not need them for his survival. He does not have to scent game. He does not have to scent danger. And with the way his smog is now, his senses wouldn't last long anyway. But in any case, he certainly, in those days, had the clearest and most complete possession of his faculties. He lived simply. He ate simply. His foods were not denatured. His life was not filled with unnecessary artificial tensions that close in our modern man. He could contemplate. His mind was not disturbed by the confusions that we know. And while he had his problems and his troubles, most certainly, he lived a simpler way of life. And with this simpler way, he was close to nature. And his intuitions, his inspirations, and his revelations had an authenticity which we cannot deny. For we know that all forms of knowledge that we boast today originated in times when the powers and faculties of man must have supplied him with the total uh, instrument with which he worked. 
he had to be able to produce these things out of himself. And because of that, we marvel at algebra, we marvel at geometry, and all of these forms of learning, but they came from the past, from long ago. Man has improved upon them. But in the dawn of time stand the shadowy figures of the originators. And these figures, some way, stand head and shoulders above those who have made new and useful applications of these first great dynamic thoughts. And in this group of dynamics belongs our problem of astronomy. Now, in astronomy in those days, we involved another term, which uh, perhaps has fallen likewise into evil times, and that is the term astrology. It is unlikely that with the exception of navigation and the calendar, that ancient man studied uh, astronomy from any great profound interest merely in the heavens and their motions. His interest was in meaning, not in motion. He was searching the heavens for truths, not facts. He was looking for dynamics, and always his problem was to apply his knowledge to the immediate problem of his own existence. And out of these long observations, which perhaps gradually evolved his concept of the seasons, came the calendar, a method of determining the periodic return of seasons, the eccentricities of the calendar, and many interesting details. The Egyptians, for example, had a calendar which corresponded with a circle, 360 days in the year, 360 degrees in the circle. But they gradually came to discover that this was not quite right. They found their year getting badly out of order. So they created five intercalendary days. And they set these days aside and apart. And to these, these days they assigned the birthdays of the five principal gods. Um, interesting also to bear in mind that the Chinese and the old Egyptians, and the very early Greeks, did not have a septenary system of planets as later came into existence. But as the Chinese call them, the five emperors, the five great sidereal emperors. For the Egyptians and the Chinese were well aware of the fact that the sun and the moon were not planets. Medieval man did not know this, however and constantly combined the planets and the luminaries to form his septenary. But the older people, like the Egyptians, decided that these five days should be the birthdays of the planets, and they set them aside. We are working now with a calendar reform project, and the only way we can make it work today is by the introduction of intercalendary days, so that now the thought is that we shall no longer have a 365-day calendar with leap years and other uh, inconveniences, with the days of the week falling on different numerical days of the month and so on, but that we shall go back to the old idea of having 360 days, 360 degrees, and set aside the five days, not this time as birthdays of the gods, but now as our five world holidays, which would not be counted. They would be the intercalendary days. In this way, we could simplify many contrivances and problems, but would make life very difficult for astrologers, who would have the problem of trying to determine this equation in correcting charts. Down in Central America, where the, lunar, where the uh, Sun-Venus calendar was represented on the scales of the great dragon, which the feathered serpent of their philosophy. It is said that the, dra the great deity of the uh, Kichi Maya complex, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, that this deity gave them the calendar, the Tanlamatl, the book of the sacred days. And by this calendar, which was ornamented 
with the symbols and devices of the gods, the world and time, both were divided into epochs, eras, and compartments, and separate units, and to each was assigned a deity. These people went so far as to assign a, a divinity to each hour of the day and night. Anticipating the medieval astrologer's planetary hour system. All through the ancient world, the calendars and the gods went together. One of the first uses of the calendar probably was to determine religious feasts. And we still have this concept in the church calendar and saints days and many other similar devices. The calendar then served a great many purposes. First and most, however, it served man to observe the seasons of his planting, of his reaping. It told him when to watch in Egypt for the inundation of the Nile upon which his life depended. It taught him to prepare for the rigors of winter in other climes. It gave him an accurate way of measuring the annual climate of his world. It also told him that each of the changes of the seasons brought new forces into play in his environment and the conditions under which he existed. Each of these changes had its good side and its bad side. Each brought something if he could know how to use it. Each took something away. Therefore, he must provide at certain times. Tithing came from putting away the seed, 10% of the seed, for the next harvest. And gradually our agrarian ancestor found that the heavens in their motions regulated his crops, which the farmer of uh, our own generation also has learned to know. Experimentation on farms in Arizona under the Department of Agriculture has shown definitely that there is a relationship between the growth of plants and the various phases of the moon and things of that nature. So in the, his practical observation, our ancient priest ancestor prophet made use of these forms of knowledge. He did not gain them immediately, but he should have been able to observe, if he kept the records, the seasonal motions over these thousands of years and observe the results in his own life. Way back in this time, a discovery was made. We do not know who made it, when it was made. But it certainly was long before the beginning of the Christian era. And it was probably made in that great philosophical complex of peoples uh, that flourished in the Near East and the Valley of the Euphrates from three to 4,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. It may have been simultaneously discovered in India and China, for the records are to be found everywhere. And that was that there was another and larger motion that had a very important bearing upon life. And this motion was the precession of the equinoxes. This term, precession of the equinoxes, to one completely unfamiliar with the subject, is just a little difficult to explain briefly. But it means that there is a slow but constant westward motion of the equinoctial points. This motion is exhilarated by a combination of solar lunar activity and slightly retarded by a reverse planetary activity. As a result of these forces pulling in contrary or inconsistent manners, this precessional motion now means and has meant as long as man can remember or learn that each year uh, the sun reaches the equinox slightly sooner than the year before. That actually his, the uh, coming of the sun is a little over one minute earlier each year, making an astronomical degree in about 60 years, about 72 years. Thus, every 72 years, uh, the sun seems to drop back at the equinox one degree. If it so does, it drops back 
approximately 30 degrees every 2160 years. And it drops back around the entire circle to any hypothetical point in one longer cycle of 25,920 years. In this period of time, the sun seems, only by appearance, seems to drop back around the entire circle of the zodiac. Falling or falling backward or failing backward at the degree, at the rate of one degree every 72 years. This has been a very important time pattern, and the complete uh, precession of the equinoxes, requiring 25,920 years, is referred to as the Great Platonic Year. Plato was aware of it 300 years or more before the beginning of the Christian era. We know it today. No one has ever been able to shake the phenomenon. We have found new explanations for what caused it. But the fact that it happens is still beyond controversy. And this peculiar heavenly motion has, has significance in a very wonderful way and is perhaps the most important link that we have between astronomy and religion in ancient times. The precession of the equinox, therefore, means that every 2160 years, the sun reaches the equinoctial point in a different sign of the zodiac, each sign constituting 30 degrees. If this occurs, then, we see the appearance of the precession in which the sun appears to enter each sign in its last degree and by procession, uh, by procession, move backward through it to its first degree, and then pass into the next sign, entering that at its last degree, and moving back to the first. So this motion appears to be in the exact opposition to the rest of the motions of planets and other elements composing the solar family. This peculiar observation the study of the Platonic year has led to a great many wonderful symbols and philosophies. To get a further picture of this, we must now move to the story of the sun. I think we all know that it is reported that our very remote forebears were sun worshippers. We know that the Pythagoreans rose at dawn each day to meet with him and song, the rising of the splendor of the day. We know also that the Hindus worship the sun god under the name of Surya and uh, honored it, riding in its chariot across the sky. We know that the sun in China was the symbol of imperial heaven and always the sun as the great symbol of light was held with extraordinary veneration. We also know that this experience of the sun was closely related to the agrarian cult or the belief that uh, religion was an experience of growth in nature. The farmer recognized his indebtedness to the sun. By degrees, men came to realize that only by the sun's power uh, would the grain grow. Only by the power of the sun would light be given so that man could go out and labor. That if he was too long separated from the sun, man himself lost much of his vitality and power. And by degrees, the sun became a God symbol. The all-seeing eye of the ancients, the eye of Horus in Egypt, is actually a symbol of the sun as is the pupil of the human eye. The sun was regarded as the eye of God, and it is said in the Bible that God made his tabernacle in the sun. All this sun worship 
was not merely a physical acceptance of the Son as a God. I've talked to a number of followers of very primitive faiths, known to be sun worshippers, and I've asked them if they actually worship the sun. They said, no, we worship or accept the sun as a symbol of a principle in the universe. It is not the visible sun, but light, the sense of consciousness, that light makes all things clear and plain and open. And we remember the Pythagorean definition of God as a being whose body is composed of the substance of light and whose spirit is composed of the substance of truth. Thus the sun was the symbol of the light of the world, the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The sun in its daily rising was the symbol of renewed hope. It was the promise of another day of opportunity, or of labor, of fulfillment. Ancient man was terribly frightened by an eclipse of the sun because he thought an evil spirit was seeking to destroy the sun. And much of our doctrine of the dragon that ate the sun and other stories and fairy tales come from eclipse phenomena. Also, eclipse phenomena seems to have sustained the belief that there was an adversary or an evil power that wanted to destroy the sun. Man did not fully understand the meaning of the solar power, but he made representations of it in gold. And these were worn by the priests as the symbols of the fact that they served the sun. Most decorations, military or civil, such as the Croix de Guerre or the Légion d'Honneur, were originally taken from sun medallions. We reward or honor the individual by bestowing a sun symbol or a rosette upon him. The uh, halos around the heads and bodies of sanctified persons have gradually taken on sun symbolism uh, attributes. These persons were radiant radiant with spiritual powers, or with great light within themselves. For the royalty, for the emperor, the king, or the, the great person, was reserved also the solar coronet. A crown is nothing but a sun, surrounded by a burst of rays. And as time went on, apparently these rays got to be a little inconvenient, sticking out in all directions, so they were turned in to the top, forming the ducal coronet and the crowns of the kings of Europe as we know them today, like the great English crown of St. George. Then among Christian peoples an orb and a cross were placed upon the top of the crown to symbolize the power of Christendom, and the crown became a radiant throne for the symbol of the Christian mystery itself. The sun, then, has always played this vital part. And we have had sun gods. Every religion has had them. They have always been wonderful, radiant beings. And nearly always they were the direct offspring of deity. They were the highest of the gods. And the tragedies that came to the sun gods were the tragedies that most affected mortals. When Balder the Beautiful, the sun god of the Nordic peoples, was slain by the mistletoe arrow, all the world wept, and darkness descended, and the joy of the gods was destroyed. Apollo was the sun god of the ancient Greco-Latin, Helios, and he is the one who drove his shafts or rays into the body of Python, or Python and caused the great serpent to be killed and thrown into a great ravine in the earth. And later upon the site of this ravine, on over the corrupting body of Python, was raised the shrine of Delphi. The sun god was always the slayer of evil, because he was the overcomer of darkness. He was always the thing that saved men from night. And later, in the place of the sun god itself, came the sun or light symbol, the candle, the torch. 
the fire. These also dispel darkness. They were protectors. And the little candle shining in darkness became the symbol of man's hope and of his faith. And later in great diffusion is preserved to us in the illuminations on the Christmas tree. The world tree with its lights is the symbol of all the candles lit from the great power of the sun. In India there was much philosophy upon the nature of the sun. And we could go into a great deal of abstract thinking relating to their knowledge of astronomy, which was profound, and upon which much of their theology is likewise based. But in round terms, because time is short, and as Hippocrates said, art is long, uh, we can only make a summary of this situation. But let us accept what is generally demonstrable, namely that upon research we find that ancient man venerated the sun as the visible symbol of an invisible power in space, as the light bearing witness to the life, that there was a life behind the light. Now remember in the Greek, Helios, later the Latin Apollo, was not regarded as the source of the solar light. He carried on his arm a great shield. And in the center of this shield was a boss or knob. And our modern astronomical symbol for the sun, a dot in a circle, is the shield of, Ar of uh, Helios, the god. And it was upon the surface of his shield that the sun god reflected the light of space. The ancient did not assume the sun to be the complete source of its own life. They assumed it to be a great focal point in space, which collected the great energies from the field of space and reflected them downward into another condition of space which we call matter. Therefore the sun was suspended twixt space and matter, causing the energy of space to permeate all material things. It's an interesting and dramatic concept. And in their ancient arrangement of planets, the sun was placed in the middle of it, with three planets below and three above, or rather two and the luminary below. Thus the sun was placed in the midst of things. It became an indicating symbol of spirit, of self, later of soul. It was that which represented finally also man, suspended between heaven and earth. It had numerous philosophical meanings, but wherever it appeared, it became an emblem of life and salvation, of redemption. The wonderful Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten created the sect or cult of Atonism, which was the worship of the solar globe, the rays ending in human hands to raise up or to lift all things, because he had already discovered from the wisdom of his people the drawing power of the sun, that the sun raised water and took it into the sky to form clouds. Ancient man watched these things, and with his own quiet wisdom he knew them well. The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu tells us in absolutely perfect modern term the entire phenomena of clouds, rainfall, and so on. These things were known, although we have forgotten that our ancestors were so wise. Now the sun deity, having to a great measure become the symbol of life, passed through three paralleling cycles of apparently similar activities. These cycles, similar in their structure, but different in their time equation. By the great processional motion, the sun seemed to retire around the zodiac in 25,920 years. By another motion, the sun seemed to progress through the signs of the zodiac, making the complete circle every 12 months, causing what we know as the year. The third cycle of the sun was its apparent motion around the earth, 
by which it achieved the mystery of the 24-hour day. These were the three cycles of the sun, the three complete circles which it made of varying magnitude. The least of these cycles in their unity was the day, which consisted of dawn as one of its important points, that in the day the dawn was its vernal equinox. Noon was its summer solstice. Sunset was its autumnal equinox. Midnight was its winter solstice. Thus the sun, according to the Egyptians, rose every morning from the underworld, traveled across the sky, and then at night descended into the land of Amentet, where it shone for all through the night for the souls of the dead in the underworld. Now, some of the old documents give us a peculiar little hint about this. They tell us, for example, one of the old manuscripts, that the people in the underworld lived upside down, walking around on their heads. Is it possible that the Egyptians had already discovered that the so-called underworld was the other side of the earth? We do not know with certainty, but we do know that they had navigated as far as the Western Hemisphere. So that it's quite possible that the people walking around upside down were not creatures of mythology, belonging in some fantastic ghost realm, but simply the recognition of something that is factually true, as far as we are concerned. In any event, the sun shone in the daytime upon the world of the living and gleamed at night in the abode of the dead. The sun also had this secondary motion in which it went its great circle of the year. It was born on the 25th of December at the winter solstice. It won its great battle. Its resurrection over winter was achieved at the vernal equinox. It was enthroned at the summer solstice which occurred at that time in the sign of the lion rather than in the sign of cancer, where we have it now, and was therefore enthroned as the lion of the tribe of Judah, and also was seated upon the throne of lions, as told by uh, the legends of King Solomon. And we know that Solomon is composed of three words, Saul, Om, On, the name of the sun in three languages. All these different symbols, and then finally at the autumnal equinox, the sun goes forth to meet the mystery of winter, where it is to finally meet its death. So the life of the sun, the annular life of the sun, from its birth to its death, became by degrees of the greatest significance to ancient man. And out of this sun going through the twelve signs of the zodiac each year, came the story of the twelve labors of Hercules, for Hercules is a solar deity, as his name implies, and also the wonderful labors of Samson, for the word Samson in Hebrew means the sun man. That we can't escape these implications, there's nothing we can do about them. We know that at the summer solstice he carries away the gates of Gaza. We know also that when he slays the Nubian lion, he enters the sign of Leo and that when he is taken into the house of Delilah and his hair is cut short, he is entering into the sign of Virgo the Virgin, which is the beginning of his decline towards winter, at which time, of course, his rays or his hair. These are cut off, and he loses his strength. But at the winter solstice, he pulls down the double columns of the house of the Philistines, and the old sun dies, making way for the new sun, which is to be born in the mystery of the winter solstice. And as the old king dies and the new king is born, we remember the words that were spoken at the court of France. The king is dead. Long live the king. 